Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we are continuing our series called The Christmas Special, Zechariah's Song. So turn your Bibles to chapter, uh, book of Luke, chapter 1. We'll continue in verse 67. Luke 1, 67. Now last time we saw that Zechariah and Elizabeth had taken their newborn son, <clears throat> he's eight days old now, and following the law to have one's chi uh, male child circumcised, they took the child to have him circumcised, probably to the temple, though the passage doesn't say they probably went to Herod's temple. And as you recall, after Zechariah wrote the boy's name on a tablet, he got his voice back. The people started talking and wondering what this child was going to be. For the Lord's hand was with him. We continue now in Luke 1, verse 67. <clears throat> His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So in the power of God, he's going to start saying some things that we have recorded in Scripture. Many important things. Well, Zechariah learned his lesson to submit to God. As you may recall, he had lost his voice when he didn't completely believe what was going to happen. The circumstances seemed so impossible. Nine long months has went by. The child is born. He writes the child's name on a tablet. Then he can talk again. The discipline is now over. And before you know it, he's back in God's service with his voice. And God can use him to make this grand announcement that he is about to make. Now, what he says is like a psalm. You know, most of the psalms are collected in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms. Now, this is called a praise psalm. We have psalms throughout Scripture, throughout the Bible, even though most of them are in the book of Psalms. Here we have one in the New Testament. And in this psalm, he's going to speak out to God in his praise. At the same time, he's going to tell us about what God is doing for the people of Israel. Now, these verses are so loaded with information that we're going to look at them one at a time. Let's go to verse 68. <clears throat> so, Zechariah is speaking this psalm, and he says, Praise be to the Lord the God of Israel, because he has come to help and redeem his people. The word for praise is sometimes translated bless. By translation, I mean from the New Testament Greek language to the English, depending on which Bible you have. Sometimes they'll translate this word bless. But praise is a way of saying thanks by telling someone how good they are. In this case, Zechariah is praising God. He praises the Lord, the God of Israel. Remember that Lord means master or owner. And this is the Lord, the God of Israel. Remember that Israel started with a man by the name of Abraham. We first learn of Abraham. His name is actually Abram. <clears throat> and he actually, God used him, God used Abram to start the Israelite people. And I'm just going to use the word Israelite. This is also the same as a Jew, 
are the Jews, the Jewish people, as so many know them today also. And <clears throat> Abraham was given a promise by God, which we'll look at later in our study this morning. But he's the one who started the Israelite people. Later on in history of Israel, we learn about Moses. Moses started the nation. Remember that God used him to lead them out of Egypt during the Exodus. And one other thing we might note here is that with Moses, God gave the nation the law. And this law told the nation how they should live. And as God's people, the Israelite, and as God's nation, as they live before the world, in the law or under the law, they showed the world not only what a holy people were, but a holy God. So the nation and the people together belonged to God. Now, we see back in our passage that the reason Zechariah wants to praise God is because he has redeemed his people. What does it mean to redeem? Well, redeem means to pay the price for something. <clears throat> if you want to buy something, it costs you a certain amount of money. And when you give that money to someone for that thing that you want, you redeem it. So in effect, it goes from <clears throat> your, the thing you want goes from them, let's say it's a video game. I'm just going to draw a little box here. It goes from that person who has it over to you, exchanges hands, so now that you have it, right? <clears throat> we call that redeem. That item has been redeemed. Sometimes you use money, sometimes you use a coupon. Sometimes you do both. But the point is, when it goes from their hand to your hand, it's been redeemed. Now, what does it mean that God has redeemed his people? Well, the Bible says that we are all sinners. And as sinners, I'm going to illustrate it this way, we are basically in a prison. As sinners, we cannot escape being a sinner. We cannot get ourselves out of that situation. <clears throat> Why can't we get ourselves out? Well, there's two reasons. One is, is that we're not qualified. A sinner cannot buy his way out because he's a sinner. And the second reason is because we don't have the price. We don't have the price. We don't have the way to pay for it. No way to pay. So how do we get out of this situation? Someone has to come along who was qualified and can pay the price so we can get out. Now the cost is the penalty of sin. 
but another sinner cannot pay that. It has to be someone who's not a sinner. Now, Jesus Christ, as the God-man, never sinned. So he is qualified. He could do it. Jesus Christ is qualified. But how could he possibly pay the price or the cost? Well, there's only one way. Someone has to pay for the sins. Someone has to pay for the sins. Now, a sinner can't do it. Only someone who has never sinned. Only someone is perfect. So Christ pays the cost or the penalty by dying on the cross for our sins. Christ paid the price for us on the cross by dying for our sins. So not only was he qualified, but he paid the price. When Jesus Christ is the perfect sinless God-man went to the cross Christ went to the cross he received the punishment of our sins God poured out our the, the punishment of our sins upon him so that not only did he die for our sins <clears throat> we know the story he was also buried and he came back alive he not only paid the price for our sins dying in our place but he also conquered death through the resurrection he paid the price Christ is our redemption. He was the price that God required for sinners to be freed from that prison of sin. Now, let's look at a scripture. I'll show it up on the screen, or you can turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures, in fact. <clears throat> Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Now listen to verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Titus 2.14, who, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So, when Jesus went to the cross, here we are over here, 
as sinners. Our penalty for our sin was going to be hell and eventually the lake of fire. But Christ received the penalty of our sins. God poured out our judgment on him. So that not only was he qualified, but he also paid the price. The Bible often refers to that spiritual death as the blood of Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness so that we are free we are free from the enslavement to sin we are free now to serve God <clears throat> and not only that when Christ was buried in the tomb and then he arose he also conquered death so that he made it possible for us also to conquer death and also to be resurrected. So Christians, those who have believed that Jesus did this for them, he died in our place, he was buried, and he resurrected, when we put our trust in what he did and who he, who he is, we too are saved. What are we saved from? We're saved from going to hell and the lake of fire. But we're also released or redeemed from being slaves to sin. So when Zechariah says that God has redeemed his people, he anticipates what Christ is going to do. Now, let's look at verse 68 one more time with verse 69. Zechariah praises the Lord. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. <clears throat> what is a horn of salvation? Well, we know what a horn is, right? Think of all the animals that have horns. A bull, a ram, a longhorn, if you're in Texas, a ram, a rhinoceros, moose, deer, usually the male deer, we call them bucks. But a horn is something strong, isn't it? It has power. It's often used as a weapon for an animal. He defends himself with a horn. So a horn here means power. <clears throat> So he has the power of salvation. He has the power to save. Notice also that this horn of salvation, in verse 69, is in the house of his servant David. Now, we ought to know what that means by now. That means he's in the dynasty. He's in the line of David. And this tells us that Zechariah knows that Jesus is in the line of David. He's a descendant of David. So the horn of salvation is a descendant of David. Verse 70, as he said through his prophets, holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. 
Now the people of Israel believed that they were going to have a Savior. They didn't always quite understand how this would work, but they believed that they would have a Savior who would not only save them from their sin and redeem them, but they also believed they would have a Savior, we might call this a political Savior, or someone who would come and deliver them from their enemies. And their enemies are those who had kept them in captivity or occupied their land, who had fought them over the many, many years. At the pl uh, present time that Zechariah wrote this, it was the nation of Rome. Israel was an occupied territory. The Roman government ran it. They ruled over it. Now, let's go over some of the things that we've learned so far. Zechariah was filled with the Spirit, and he says that God has come to redeem his people. He has the power to save and also salvation from their enemies. Now the next thing that Zechariah says that God is doing, this is in verse 72 and verse 73, look at them together, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. Let's first of all talk about the word mercy. Mercy. Mercy is showing love or compassion for someone when they're hurting. Uh, if you remember many of the stories of Jesus, he would show mercy on someone who was sick or was, was lame, and he would heal them. Mercy is also being kind to someone who has hurt you. Let's see. Let's think of an example. Let's say your mom or dad tell you not to touch the TV controls. But they're not in the room and you want to change the channel. So when they're gone, you change the channel. And then you go off to your room to do something with the controls in your hand. And you take the controls to your room and you put them somewhere and forget about them. Now your parents are in the living room looking for the controls. But they're not there. Why? Because they're in your room. And they ask you if you know where they are. And you forget that you brought them into your room, but you don't know where you put them. Now, not only have you touched the controls and changed the channel, but now you've lost the controls. So your parents go the whole evening without the controls. And then it's time to put you to bed. And your mom or dad comes in there to put you in bed. And guess what they find in the blankets? They find, your, they find the controls. Now, did you do wrong? Yes. Not only did you change the channel and touch the controls, but you had lost them. Now, what do your parents do? No TV for the, for the next few days. No video games. Maybe they even spank you. But instead, they decide to say, I'm glad we found the controls. You shouldn't have done it. We love you. Good night. And you just think that's awesome. They showed you mercy by not punishing you even though you deserved it. Rather than punish you, 
they showed you mercy. Now, let's go back to verse 72. God has shown mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. So he's talking about that God has shown mercy to our fathers. That would be not only Zechariah's parents, but all the parents of the Israelites before him. God has come to show mercy on the people of Israel. Remember, we are all sinners. And now God has come to show mercy. And he's going to do it in several ways. Now, let's look at, first of all, before we look at those ways, let's look at what it means to remember his holy covenant, which is also described as the oath he swore to our father Abraham. Remember in our first lesson, we learned about the promise to David, which became the Davidic covenant. God had promised that David would have a son who would rule over the house of Israel forever. The Davidic covenant. Well, God also made a covenant with Abraham. So now we're going to look at what we call the Abrahamic covenant. Now, these are two of the major covenants in the Old Testament. And they actually get fulfilled not only in the Old Testament, but also, I mean, in some of it in the Old Testament, some of it in the New Testament. Okay? In fact, the word covenant, guess what? Also means testament. <clears throat> we just looked at another covenant a moment ago. Remember which one that was? The Mosaic Covenant. Those are the three major covenants of the Old Testament. And we're not going to get into this right now, but we actually live under a new covenant. And we know what book we call that we live primarily by? Yes, the New Testament. And those are four of the major covenants in the Bible. The Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the New Covenant. But let's talk about, right now, the Abrahamic covenant. Let's turn, or you can just look at the screen, in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. God starts out with Abraham by giving him a promise. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 through 4. We'll just look at verses uh, 2 and 3. He says, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In chapter 15 verse 5, God adds more with more promise. 
he takes Abraham outside and he said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. Well, if you know the story of Abram and Ab or Abraham, God had led Abram and his family from an area called Ur. And now God has given Abram, whose name is later changed to Abraham, some promises. In Genesis 15, God has Abraham go outside at night and look up. Abraham could see thousands of stars. And God makes him this promise. In verse 7, God promised Abraham a land for him and his people. Well, Abraham wanted to know for sure how this would be his land. So God takes this promise one step further. He gives him a guarantee. He makes a covenant with Abraham. <clears throat> Verse 18. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Catamites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. So God guarantees the land to Abraham with this covenant. Then later he adds more to the covenant, the guarantee, in chapter 17 of Genesis. This is a long and important part. Let's look at it. We'll read through it. Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or brought up or bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. Now notice, Abraham's part of the contract was to have every male... <clears throat> who was an Israelite, circumcised at eight days old. And of course, we've already seen that with John. And we will see it later with Jesus. Now this covenant had several important elements in it. Several important parts. Abraham would have many descendants. 
That means many children. And this came true. Many nations came from Abraham. So he would have many. I'm just going to use the word children. He would have children. His children have children and so on. Second thing we see is that he would have a land. They would have their own land. This is the land of Israel. And the third thing we see is they would be a blessing. A blessing to the world. And this comes true through the fact that in his line of children would come Jesus. And who was his mother? Mary. And Mary was from Israel. Now, <clears throat> the, Israelite, the Israelite people began with Abraham, and it goes all the way down to Mary, who has Jesus. Now, the next thing we see in Zechariah's song is in verse 74. Verse 74, where we see that he has also come to rescue his people from the hand of his enemies and enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all his days. As I said earlier, the people of Israel also expected someone to save them from their political enemies. They expected the Messiah, which is another word for Christ. Messiah is more of the Old Testament word. Let's look at that. Messiah. The Greek or the what we call is uh, Christos, which we get the word Christ. So these mean the same thing and they all mean anointed one. It's a way of saying someone who's going to be the king. Okay? anointed one. So let's try to remember that Messiah, the Old Testament word, Christos, which becomes Christ, is the New Testament word, and they mean anointed, and they mean king. And they are having, at this time in history, their king being born. His name is Jesus. So, <clears throat> let's sum up what we've seen in this song. Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, says that God has come to redeem his people. He has the power to save, that would be from sin, salvation from their enemies, there's going to be rescue from their enemies also to show mercy and to remember the Abrahamic covenant. So the people of Israel knew, those who listened to the prophets and teachers, that David would have an offspring who would rule forever. And now Zechariah has acknowledged to this praise that God has come to, in the form of a God-man, Jesus Christ, to provide these things. Again, we'll look at it one more time. To redeem his people, he has the power to save, salvation from their enemies, to show mercy, 
to remember the Abrahamic covenant, to rescue them from their enemies so they can serve the Lord without fear. Now, we've just seen and learned what Zechariah said about Jesus. Next time, he starts to speak about what his own son, John, will do. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for all these things you tell us from your scripture about the coming Jesus. In those days, they anticipated so much. And now, Father, we should be so thankful for what you've done for us. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.